bet on the jockey. Office might be the most contrarian investment out there right now. And and I personally wouldn't have the stomach for it. I am sure there are going to be really good office managers that are going to be very successful navigating these waters and be able to take advantage of a very distressed environment and be very successful right now, as there have been retail investors over the last few years that have been very successful. I think the most important thing is betting on that jockey who, number one, has the integrity, the transparency, and is going to be working hard and, and, and executing and staying disciplined on their strategy. Then I think it's the, the most, the, then that, that works. Uh, I think very few investors, you know, maybe if you're that big pension fund, you can have a worldview that is why you want to allocate or why you have a asset allocation that requires a, you know, an investment to industrial and you're maybe over allocated hospitality. These high net worth investors, certainly they should have a degree of diversification. I'm not saying they shouldn't, but they should be investing and thinking about their jockey and not necessarily overly thinking about the deal. I thought a great place to start would be this weird interaction we just had in the parking lot before lunch, where you and I were talking about a GP fund and this guy walking by heard and then was telling us that he has a fund and asking us if we need money from him right there in the parking lot. And maybe you can use that story to describe the period that we recently went through post-COVID in real estate, specifically industrial real estate in your space and maybe even how Miami might be different from the rest of the country with respect to everyone with a fund. Yeah, well, I don't know if that commentary uh, (laughs) was more about what's happening in South Florida as the the sort of unique environment where, you know, the economy and real estate is still, you know, certainly exuberant, or just a commentary on where we are in the cycle. And like in the the old days of 2007, before the global financial crisis, where the taxi drivers were investing in, and 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 the strippers were investing in uh, in pre sale apartments, but it definitely is a it, it's it's a story for something. So, but anyway, Jake, it's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, in in terms of where we are in the cycle and in in South Florida specifically, uh, you know. I'm in, I'm involved in the industrial business, as you know, uh, uh, specifically my multi-tenant light industrial flex, and in many ways, our asset class is very similar to what's happening in South Florida. Sort of, this, it's a bit of this outlier. It's an asset class where there's still significant uh, demand by tenants. Uh, we're still leasing. We're still have seeing positive, you know, leasing activity. Rents are generally still tr- on an upward trajectory. Uh, my my comment in the last few months where we've seen a little bit of softening is we're, we're less strong, we're not weak. Um, and I think that's a little bit similar to what's happening in general in South Florida, where you've seen, you know, uh, an environment which is sort of contrary to the rest of the, to the real estate cycle, where South Florida, forget about industrial, just across the board has been, I would think the the top market in the in the country, and uh, you know it's a it, again it goes back to the basics of of economics that we all learned a long time ago of supply and demand. Uh, South Florida is a place where people want to live, people want to be. Uh, therefore, you know the demand is high, and 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 there, it's a supply constrained market, and demand is and the 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 supply of, of a product is low, and uh, especially from a residential perspective, I think you're going to see that continue. Certainly, you know, there might be a little overbuilding of apartments. Uh, uh, you could speak more to the hospitality business than I can, but uh, and but if if I, I fortunately don't own uh, office, I have a little bit of legacy office that we still we do we do own. We're not in the office business, but if you had to be in the office business anywhere in the world, I guess owning office in Miami probably be the best place in in, in at least the United States to own office. I is just you know as an example, I just resigned my lease. I just renewed in uh, my building. We lease uh, in, in, on Brickell Avenue, and I think my rent went up over twenty percent. So uh, now hard to finance that building, hard yep. to sell that building. But from a tenant demand perspective, the the demand is still very strong and the supply is low, and that's the same thing that's we're seeing in uh, multi tenant light industrial. When you think about your start in real estate and your career, what were some of the key moments that? change your tra- trajectory and maybe you can use those to kind of narrate how you got into real estate. Yeah. Happy to. So, uh I'm fortunate I think in many ways, but uh fortunate in the sense that uh I come from a real estate family and I and I grew up in the business. Uh I didn't uh you know go to college and decide to to get into real estate or 
you know, do my thesis uh, in business school on on why multi-tenant light industrial would someday be the best asset class in a global pandemic and uh, and, and and in a world of of moving towards uh, e-commerce. Uh, I I grew up in a in a family that my grandfather was a developer of apartments and. Uh, he moved uh, the family down from the New York area to South Florida in the mid 1950s. My father also uh, was in the real estate business. Decided to do something a little bit separate from from my grandfather and built a, a mostly uh, industrial, very similar product to what I continue to to buy existing today. But was a developer of a, of, of industrial in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, and and really. Uh, as a developer, uh, st- was still very active until very recently when he uh, when he uh, stepped away from his business. But um, I joined my family business in 2001. I, I spent a few years after college working for a large real estate company in New York as an analyst, did the analyst thing. So I got a little experience outside the family business, which I think is important. And I spent a few years working. Uh, so in 2001, joined that family business, and uh, I had. A great family business experience, um, but uh, as we know, family business is hard, and uh, I, and I've had the 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 privilege of both having a family business experience, but also getting to be a first generation entrepreneur. Uh, so I spent eleven years in the family business, uh, primarily working under the acquisition side of the business. Even though my father, by passion and interest, is a developer, he started doing acquisitions of existing uh, uh, before I ever joined his business, and I. Uh, I really was mu- much more interested in that side of the business. I was always uh, interested in the finance side of the business. Even to this day, I don't have the don't have the the the, the risk adjusted appetite uh, for for development. I really prefer buying ex- existing properties that have cash flow. Um, one of the things that my uh, my father has always said about my grandfather is he always said he was in the income producing property business, and I I sort of take that to heart. I believe at its core, real estate should be income producing, should be providing a distribution stream to its investors, and should be you know effectively the goose that's laying golden eggs, and um, and and that's what we strive to do today. Um, I was with that family business, like I said, for eleven years, and then in two thousand and twelve, decided I wanted to start my own business. And uh, very much ultimately with the support of my my father and my family, I had the opportunity to spin off from that family business. And uh, I created my own company, which uh, I still manage today. Uh, and that sort of coincided with us getting into the fund business. So in 2010, uh, entered the, the, the fund management business and really decided that that was a better widget for us uh that we we came from the world of working with big private equity firms my father had a big relationship uh with a, a, a an entity that was an apollo entity and uh we worked with some other private equity firms as well and that was a great model for from the late 90s through the you know effectively the global financial crisis but sitting in the global financial crisis i decided that that wasn't the optimal model for our strategy that we wanted to have uh, to be a little bit closer to the capital and effectively cut out the middleman, which uh, enabled us to to reduce the gross to net spread, uh, which allowed us to get a better risk adjusted return for our investors. When you talk about gross to net spread, are you thinking about it in terms of the total gross IRR multiple on the deal, and then what potentially the fund after the double promotes investor is receiving, or are you just thinking about it in terms of? getting it to the fund, not even what their investors are looking at. I'm thinking about what the end investor gets. I mean, ultimately, there's an end investor, and whether that investor is a high net worth investor or you know a huge uh, pension fund, uh, their ultimate return is what I think is the most relevant. And if you need, if, 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 if you know, today we try to seek a sort of 12 to 13% net IRR to the investor, if you need to get a 20% gross IRR to, to, to get them there, that's a uh, that uh, effectively means there's over 700 basis points of dilution uh, from gross to net, uh, which means that you're taking a fair amount of risk in order to generate a fairly moderate level of return. What we've done over the years by gro- by by being a direct operator, by being a direct fund manager, and and not having uh, another investor, you know, as, a, as an additional layer. Uh, is we'd be able to reduce that to we seek a 16 to 17 percent gross IRR, and therefore the gross to net spread is something in the neighborhood of you know 350 to 450 basis points uh, versus you know over 700 basis points. How has the fund investing model changed, and how has it impacted 
people's desire to take on more risk? It's a little bit of a loaded question, but my view is maybe in the 90s, these funds started to emerge and people were doing their own deals, but they got so good at raising capital, they didn't have enough deals for the capital that they were raising. So they had to find other operators to deploy capital to, which caused this double promote thing. And it made it really hard to get enough return to the investor unless you levered up a deal or took on more risky deals. How have you seen it change in your career and why were you so convinced that you didn't want to rely on allocators? Yeah, that's a great question. And when you know, I was telling my story, I, I, I specifically featured the, the global financial crisis, the GFC that you know, took place in 2008, 2009, which you know, despite what everybody thinks about the current environment is still a far deeper economic challenge uh, than what anything we're close to seeing today. But uh, when, when I was still with my family business at that period of time, and I really came to the conclusion that the right capital source for us was to go closer to, to, to direct to the end investor. And the primary reason for that is because when you have that wide gross net spread, inevitably you're taking more risk. And I saw that the people that were getting in trouble during the GFC, they were the people that were over-levered, and they were the people that didn't have the cash flow to, to, to sustain their investments. So if you bought a property in 2006, and it had the cash flow, you weren't over-levered, and you could hold it till 2012, you were fine. I mean, you might not have been in your promote, you might not have raised, you know, you might not have had a huge profit, but you didn't lose the property, and you probably didn't lose money. The people that lost their properties to the bank were the people that did that were over-levered, and they didn't have the cash flow to, to weather that storm. And I sort of surmised at that time that part of the reason why people did that is by they were they were they were trying to seek home runs. They were trying to get to a return that's much more difficult to get to because they were trying to satisfy a capital source. I decided that if we can, you know, not have that type of capital source, if we can that for our strategy, which is multi-tenant light industrial, keep in mind that we, we are value add investors, but we are value add investors in a very different way. We're value add investors because we think we're, we're, we're really strong operators and we're, we're really focusing on the blocking and tackling of the business every day. You know, if you talk about something like apartments or even I imagine hotels, it's a lot, when you're, when you're a value add investor, you could, you could have a strategy of, you know, repl- upgrading the bathrooms, upgrading the, the, the kitchens, you know, providing better F and B in your, in your hospitality investments. In industrial, it's much more difficult from a capital perspective to to add value. You can't make the the warehouse higher. You can't increase the ceiling heights. Yes, you can you know make it a little bit more attractive. You could you know paint it. You can work on the facade. But the 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 box is effectively the box. And our tenants aren't looking for amenities. They're looking for the the right hole to fit their peg into. Uh, but what where you can do a better job is on operating. And we really are, especially for our more multi-tenant pro- product, where our average tenant size is about 10,000 feet, we really believe that we're great operators. And we really focus as a vertically integrated company and being strong operators. But back to the original question, if you're if you're seeking that sort of opportunistic level return, that 20% or greater IRR, it's very challenging to do that with a light industrial strategy that is focused on, on, on really enhancing operations and focusing on blocking and tackling. But you can do it if you're seeking a 16 to 17% IRR. And what you could do is take a lot less risk, buy properties, not overlever them, have fairly moderate leverage, and really be able to, even in today's environment, when interest rates are higher, still provide a, a nice cash flow distribution to our investors, going back to what my grandfather said, being in the income producing property business. How have you found to add value, or how are you a good operator? on your own merit, but also when you compare yourself to some of your peers and your competition? Yeah, it, it all starts with our number one statistic, which is renewal ratio. It's like any other business. Keeping an existing customer is a lot cheaper than getting a new one. So, you know, if you look at, you know, our, our types of properties, and I think it is probably true in, in, in most other properties as well, certainly it's true in office, uh, the expense that you have of losing a tenant uh, which includes the downtime, the period of time that your 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 space is vacant, but also a, a, a retrofit, a tenant a, a tenant improvement expense, which is typically three to four times greater on a new lease than it would be on a renewal. 
plus a higher leasing commission. You pay higher leasing commissions on new leases than, than, than you do on renewals. And then you have risk. I mean, while you might have in your model some great business plan of saying goodbye to the uh, existing tenant that might be playing a, a, a low rent, paying a little bit of more, more money in tenant improvement allowances because you're going to bring in a higher paying rent tenant, that doesn't always pan out the way you uh, put it on paper. Uh, you know, a, 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 a former partner of mine uh, used to be fond of saying paper can accept anything. Uh, so we are very focused on renewals. We're very focused on uh, our, our tenants. We believe our tenants are our most important customers. While we love our investors and we think our investors are incredibly important too, the reason why they're going to be successful is our tenants are going to be successful. If our tenants are successful and we treat them with the great customer service that we we provide, uh, then then we're going to have a higher renewal ratio. We're going to keep our tenant our properties higher leased. And we'll have a much better chance of raising rents when we're, our properties are well leased and highly occupied than if you're constantly having revolving door of tenants. So what goes into that? That that ha- that means that it's one thing to say that in, in your core values and talk about it in your corporate office, but it means that the people that are in the boots on the ground, the property managers, the uh, the engineers, the, the maintenance people that are physically in the field that are dealing with the tenants day to day have to really live that and have to understand that. So as an example, we, we, we have a complimentary service uh, program with our with our tenants that, you know, things like 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 changing the the roof tiles or changing light bulbs, things that are not typically within the, the lease. But if we have a maintenance person that's able to do it, we're going to be do that on a comp- complimentary level. It means actually really caring about your tenants. And, you know, to the extent that, you know, they have challenges being able to work with them. And maybe, you know, you do give them a little bit of rent relief when you're in a time like COVID, but you do it in exchange for, for longer terms on, on uh, extensions. Uh, we value our tenants. We really do believe they're, they're our customers. And we, 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 we really believe that their success is going to ultimately immure to our success. How much of your investment strategy is made on the buy, meaning buying it cheap or better than other people, versus the appreciation of the real estate? And maybe you can also describe like how the cash flow factors in, because a lot of industrial deals that I've seen, the cash flow seems smaller relative to the IRR. So there is potentially a lot of upside on the sale that people are underwriting, or maybe I'm looking at the wrong Yeah, so, so we buy this more multi-tenant light industrial flex product that uh, tends to trade at higher cap rates, uh, tends to have more cash flow. Again, even in these times when, when interest expense is higher, uh, we're still able to buy properties with a, with a, a small spread between our cap rates uh, that we're entering in on and our interest expense. Uh, so Certainly, that would be true if you were buying more of a bulk industrial product that is going to be trading even today at a fairly low cap rate. You know that is at a significantly uh, lesser, uh, lower uh, cap rate than what you would see. Uh, uh, sorry, lower interest rates than what you would see as the cap rate. Um, that is not what we buy. We buy this more multi-tenant light industrial flex product. It's a it, it's it's a product that uh, is more management intensive, which requires us as operators to really roll up our sleeves and and and, and be willing to get you know our, our get get you know involved in the operating of the properties. Uh, today we manage uh, a little over seven million square feet, but that I mentioned our average tenant size is about ten thousand square feet. So that means we have over seven hundred tenants, and that's not a multifamily building where you know every tenant you know every lease every two bedroom goes for the same rate. You know, last year we we, we negotiated over two hundred leases. Uh, everyone in a customized fashion. Every one of them requires a certain amount of you know tenant build out. Uh, you know, there's expansions, there's contractions. It's a constant jigsaw puzzle of keeping these properties well leased. And 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 uh, and there are some operators that you know might say to a tenant that they they need to expand, so therefore you need to move their neighbor. And and, and you're in, in order to basically maintain occupancy, you're doing three or four transactions of working that jigsaw puzzle. Some operators, some uh, landlords say might not be might not be worth it to them. If you hire a third party, you know, a big you know service provider, certainly wouldn't be worth it to them. It's worth it to us. We do everything possible to maintain occupancy. Uh, so I, I, I went on that. I forgot the question. What was the? <laughs> well, how important is it on the buy? On the buy. Listen, you can't. The buy is always important. You can't. You can't operate yourself out of a bad buy. But you could take a good buy and ruin it with bad operations. Uh, we've seen that all the time. We 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 love to buy from. Uh, large institutions that may be less focused on the operation of their properties. And we think we could come in there and with a little bit more TLC, 
uh, do a little bit better operating the properties than than they're doing. Um, but yeah, you, you buying is you have to buy right. You always have to buy right. You can't make a mistake on the buy. And you know, especially in an environment that we're in today, I keep on preaching to our investors uh, that this is a time for patience. And and we've been very slow in allocating our new fund, uh, but we're okay with that. And I I am. I'm very comfortable getting to the end of the investment period of our of our of, we're currently investing our fund five. I'm very comfortable getting to the end of our investment period uh, and either asking for a little bit more time to deploy capital or deciding we're not going to fully invest in this fund and we'll move on to the next one. But what you can't do is make a bad deal. You make a bad deal, you buy you buy wrong, then you're really in trouble. But like I said a minute ago, you could buy right and really not operate well. And if you buy right and you know, you're not attentive to the properties. You're not willing to do those multiple deals to accommodate that expansion of that tenant, uh, and you start hemorrhaging tenants. And all of a sudden, your 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 strong cash flow, that nice spread between cap rate and interest rate that you thought you'd have, uh, deteriorates. And all of a sudden, you're you 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 do have a property that is not well leased. Uh, it could go away very fast. How do you think about hold period? And you're in a fund model, so presumably you eventually have to sell. Have you ever thought of? creating some sort of vehicle where you don't have to sell? It's a great question. And it's something that we think about constantly. And I do think it's the one area that uh, I've said this for years, that our investors are sort of misaligned with themselves. You know, uh, I think real estate uh, as a income producing asset uh, is something that uh, is best and, and most efficiently held for years. Our, as you know, our investors benefit from a lot of tax benefits. They get the benefit of depreciation that we pass through to the investors. Uh, we're a very efficient investment until that day that we ultimately do sell it. Uh, that said, as you pointed out, we are in a fund model. And uh, the reason for that is it's very, very challenging to raise capital uh, in, in in a more permanent structure. In, in, in advance of my most recent fund, Fund 5, I, I thought about moving to a more permanent capital structure and, and even converting our older investments into rolling everything into a more permanent capital vehicle. And I was convinced by friends, by my employees to not let uh, good be the enemy of, of not, not let, let perfect be the enemy of, of, of good. And we have a very good model. Uh, we have investors that have, have real confidence in us. Uh, we are a mid to long term holder. We sort of we we hold properties on average seven years, so we are a relatively long term investor. But we also have gotten to the end of a fund length uh, and and have decided to hold certain strong properties. We actually just did that uh, in January, where we we we've been coming to the end of the the conclusion of our third fund, and we took six of the best properties that we felt were really strong long term holds. We said to the investors in that fund, this is what we consider to be the value of them. We actually got third-party valuations, obviously, in addition to that, uh, that sort of validated our, 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 our perspective on their, on their value. And we offered all those investors that said, you have the right to stay in, or you could exit at this price, and we'll go out and find new capital to replace you. And that's what we did. Uh, we successfully rolled over these six investments. And all those investors that were able to stay in were able to roll in in a maintaining their existing tax basis. So it was a very efficient investment, uh, very efficient rollover for those investors that stayed in. And we think that's a little bit of a, a way to, you know, have your cake and eat it too. We 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 certainly like the the closed end fund model. Has it, it makes sense because there are people who need to know that they're going to get their money back, and uh, they they want that bookend. They want that that period of investment and that uh, when it starts and that period of investment when it ends. But we also, the, many of those same people who, when I originally spoke to them, asked about when they're going to get their money back are also the same people that ultimately rolled over and they wanted to you know, maintain that investment. They didn't want to have to redeploy. They didn't want to pay taxes. They didn't want to have that inefficiency of a sale. Um, so we think we, we, we've we found a widget that works. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if we keep iterating and we find, uh, if I someday, uh, have a permanent vehicle, it wouldn't be totally surprising. Are you able to crystallize your promote in that structure where you can maintain your economics now forever and not be worried about some sort of time horizon? Yeah. So we were able to, we, 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 when, when we did that transaction, we made our promote, uh, or, or, or not the entire promote, but the large portion of the promote. And a significant portion of that, we you know, we rolled into the new investment, so effectively crystallizing, and it went from being a promoted interest to an actual investment interest that also generates cash flow distributions and depreciation, and has all the benefits of ownership. Uh, so yeah, we were able to accomplish that. What is the most challenging part about 
executing business plans in your business or executing the investment thesis? So uh, as, as much as I think tenants are the most important customers, they're also sometimes the most challenging. Uh, you know, we, we are constantly dealing with tenant issues. Uh, you know, just we, we have a great fund five investment uh, that has a major Fortune 500 company that for when we bought the property had a lot of interest in, in downsizing, or actually in, in vacating the property. They no longer needed the space. And we negotiated a buyout of their lease. At the same time, a, a, another tenant of the property was interested in taking over the space and we negotiated a new lease. By the time we got it all done, the tenant who was interested in vacating changed their mind. <laughs> so, you know, there's constantly those issues that you have to, you know, be willing to roll with the punches uh, as an operator and recognize that, you know, tenants have their own motivations. And just because one day they decided they wanted to use less space and a few months later they decided they needed the space again, those things happen. Uh, so tenants can be can be challenging. Uh, but to me, that was, that's not the most important. You know, the, 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 to, to me, the most important part of the business is our people. You know, I, I focus a lot of time uh, on, I think, as an executive, one of the most important things we do is, is hire and, 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 and train and, and instill culture in our teams. And, uh, you know, whether or not that tenant ultimately, you know, wants to do that deal. And, you know, one, one of the things I always like to say is, you know, there's no acquisition we're going to make. There's no lease that we're going to sign. There's no debt we're going to negotiate. There's no sale we're going to make. There's not even a big rollover uh, uh, opportunity like the one we just talked about that is going to transform the future of our business. But people can transform the future of your business. And the junior person that you're hiring today might end up being you know, one of the stars of your business for the next 20 years that helps you get into a new business line. So we really work on on, on people. We really care. We value our people. And uh, you know, that's where, you know, I, I, I think, you know, as leaders, we need to spend the most of our, of our time. On the investment side of your business, how do you create incentives for those team members? And how has your approach changed throughout the years as you've grown the business and learned from mistakes or figured out what works and what doesn't? So we think it's really important to have, you know, our, for our people to, to, to really truly feel like owners and to be invested. Uh, we share a significant portion of, of, of carried interest uh, with our senior team. So our senior team, you know, we, we, we call the business Adler Partners. You know, the, the, that is, you know, certainly my last name is Adler and there's a historical uh, Adler relationship to real estate that we wanted to maintain, that we wanted to keep that name. But we also wanted to feature the fact that it's not just about me or, or, or that family legacy, that it's about the people that are, you know, in the company that are making it happen day to day. And our senior team is very much invested uh, through the carried interest. And almost all of our senior employees also invest themselves in our deals. Now, they don't have an obligation to do that. When we take, when, 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 whenever we start a new investment and, and specifically a fund, there's a management commitment that the management team makes towards that, uh, to that fund. I take on that management commitment entirely. And whatever our employees do is adds to that, is additional. But uh, but almost all of our senior team members are meaningfully invested relative to their position in our funds. Do you sometimes loan them money in, in order to do that? It's happened. Uh, there's people that have asked to to borrow money against you know their future uh, bonuses or carried interest, but it's not often. Uh, it, it, but it has happened. Do you think oftentimes in real estate people get a share of the carry too early, and have you given that? too early before you really know what their contribution is going to be? It's a, it's a definite area of concern. And I think it's, you know, I'm fortunate that, uh, my senior team has been together for a long time. Uh, the, my two, uh, senior partners in the business helped start the business with me in 2012. And we're part of, uh, our, the predecessor family business, uh, prior to that. So, you know, they've earned the significant amount of carry that they have over years and years. Um, with more junior people, we tend to not allocate a specific amount, like at the beginning of a fund, we'll bonus them and they'll, they'll know they're part of it and we, we prove it. You know, we, 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 we're at the point of our life cycle where we're making carry interest, not annually, but, you know, every couple of years. 
and you know when we we had a significant event as i mentioned in january when that event happened we bonused people in a, in a significant manner and up above and beyond what their typical bonuses were in 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 the you know a few a, a month earlier at year end uh so we've proven that we're going to do that but we we're not just giving significant carried interest uh to people too early now, even when we do give carried interest, we obviously do it with, you know, with with with, with some controls and uh and and there is vesting. Uh so we're not just allocating carried interest and and people can just get up and leave uh or or not do the to not do a good job. So uh I think having a carried interest program which is significant and gives and makes people feel very invested, but also has a appropriate vesting structure. So one of the things that we do is we vest people uh about 12 and a half percent for per year but the final 25 percent so they vest over six years that final 25 percent doesn't realize until the actual carry interest is realized so if a fund takes longer it takes 10 years not seven uh they're gonna have to wait to get that final 25 percent and be here when that fund is actual that 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 economic event actually materializes so having survived multiple real estate cycles have you given any thought to how to solve for the fact that you might be out of a carry, but the deal is actually still relatively a, a good deal on a multiple basis. So you gave an example, if you bought something in 2006 and then you sold it in 2012, you might be out of the carried interest or the promote given the duration and the slow period. How have you thought about mitigating that or figuring that out in your structures for the future? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Frankly, I've never had the issue to date so fortunately haven't had to deal with it i i uh i imagine there are people that are dealing with that today and had to deal with it during the during the pandemic and uh so we have not been in that position to have to deal with that um but i do think part of the 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 reason is is that it's important to align a structure with your risk tolerance so one of the things that we're, we're a fairly moderate risk, you know, structure. We're like I said, looking to net investors at 12 to 13% IRR, uh, which I consider as sort of a, you know, value add risk, sorry, value add return with sort of core plus risk, because we're not taking a lot of, we're not buying a lot of vacancy. We have a lot of cash flow from inception. And our value add, as I said, is is in the form of a lot of blocking and tackling. We're not, we're not needing to create a tremendous amount of value in order to achieve the returns we have. And because our investors are effectively getting a moderate return, the, the the way we've structured our carry is we don't have any kind of hurdles. We're not looking to like hurdle from a 20% promote to a 30% promote to a 40% promote. When you have those type of hurdles, what you're effectively saying to your investors, I'm trying to get to 40% promote. And, you know, in order to get to that 40% promote, I need to get over a 20% IRR or whatever it is. I'm a singles and doubles hitter that's looking to never strike out. And if I never strike out, and as long as I get, if you look at the, the way that our, our carry is structured, as long as we get to a 10% IRR, a 10% gross IRR, we're going to fully catch up with our investors. Now, we don't want to get to a 10% gross IRR. We're looking to get to a 16 17% gross IRR. So when we can net to our investors a, a 13%. But as long as we get to a 10% gross IRR, we're going to fully catch up. So that gives us a lot of room in a... In, in, in an environment where things might not always go the way that you think they're going to go, uh, sort of our, we, when, the way we look at downside is we never want to lose money. We never want to strike out. And we minimally want to get those properties to a 10% IRR because all of our properties are crushed. We have what's called a, a, a European waterfall. So we're not making our carried interest until the final couple properties in a, in a fund are ultimately sold. But we also have a very low hurdle and we have confidence that uh, with our risk and our return structure that we're going to get there. And uh, we have meaningful promote in all of our funds that we still have. So you have a low hurdle, but do you have a low-ish promote percentage above that hurdle? Yeah, we have a very traditional, what I would consider a private equity model. So we have an 8% pref. Uh, first thing, the first part of our waterfall is return capital. Then we have an 8% pref. And then we have a, a, a hundred, depending on investment profile and size, for, for institutional investors, we have a 50-50 catch-up. For family office high net worth investors, we have 100% catch-up. 
Uh, and then we uh, are 80, we, we make a 20% promote or carried interest investors get 80% of the fund. So we never make more than 20, but if all goes well and we fully catch up either to that 10, or as I mentioned with institutions, the 50, 50 means you catch up to a 12, you're still making 20% of the profits. So if you take a meaningfully sized fund and you only did a 10% gross IR, not again, certainly not the goal, but there's still going to be meaningful carried interest, even if, uh, in a, in a, in a suboptimal vehicle. And when you're talking about catch up, I just want to break it down. So no one's missing it. Basically the investor gets the first dollars until an 8% pref. And then you start getting your share of the promote along with the investor also getting continued share of their promote or their uh, it, interest. It's, it's smart that you're delving into this because I think it's something that very few investors truly understand the catch up. And I think a lot of investors will m- maybe see a deck and it says in parentheses with the catch up provision and they're like, you know, they think ketchup is something that goes on a hamburger and they yeah. don't really delve into <laughs> what that means. And uh, and I think you, I'm, I'm struck constantly by meeting real estate operators who don't who aren't familiar with the, what, what a ketchup really is. So what a ketchup provision means is that I'm sharing in carried interest from the first dollar, not just above that eight. So the yes, we have an eight pref and that our investors will get all their money back and an eight pref. And if that's all we, we we made, if we if we had a fund vintage that did an 8% gross IRR, I would get nothing. But once it goes above that 8%, I get a either 50% or 100% of the of, of the profits until I get my pro rata share of the of, of return from the first dollar. So I will be making 20% of all profits, assuming we catch up. That's a big difference. It's a huge difference. And if you really look at it, you know, I think, you know, there's a lot of operators that look at, you know, their waterfall and they're like, oh, you know, I have an eight pref and then I, I have a 20% promote above an eight and then above a 10, it goes to a 25 and above a 15, it goes to a 30. And eventually I get up to a 40 or a 50 and they look at their model and it's like, oh, you only get 20. That's a, that's a lot lower. Uh, but I think if you really look at the math and, uh, and where the break even point would be, you know, I think you'd have to get to over a 20% yeah, uh, you know, gr- no, well over 20%, probably over a 24, 25% gross IRR in order for them to even to come close to doing better. And they have a lot more risk on the downside. On the down, you know, well, t- take somebody who, you know, take take that simplistic example of a 10% gross IRR. So somebody who has a, a, a 20% IRR above an eight will make 20% of two. So they'll make, you know, 40 basis points. The difference between eight okay. and 10, that's it. Okay. I make 2%. So I make 200 basis points. They make 40 basis points. So I make, you know, five times more than them uh, in, 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 in a 10% IRR scenario. Uh, obviously, as returns go up, they will participate in higher percentage of the ups. Point is, I am incentivized to not make mistakes. I am incentivized to not strike out. My, I, I'm... I'm not shy about sharing this structure because I think the structure reflects our risk. When you have that that tiered structure as a in, as, as a developer or whatever, you are saying to your investors, "I am taking more risk." Now that hopefully is what they should be doing. They should be taking more risk because it's a higher risk strategy, a development strategy, a, 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 a deep repositioning strategy, an opportunistic strategy. I'm in a moderate risk strategy, and my strategy and my risk are aligned in that my investors are saying to me. Don't take too much risk. Get cash flow. Make distributions. Don't look to swing for the fences. Look to never strike out. And, and that's what we do. And it's also more consistent. One of the things we've been talking about for a couple of years, you and I, is how to build a real estate investment company. I think a lot of people go into real estate and they start a little investment company and every opportunity for upside comes at the end. It basically comes in the promote. They have no ongoing cash flow to run their business. And one of the things that you taught me very early on is your business has to survive on its own with no promote. So maybe you can just talk about that philosophy and how you've seen it through your career. No question. And you did a great podcast that I listened to uh, uh, on fees that I thought were that we thought was very instructive in this point. And if you haven't listened to that, I suggest going back into the to the archive and, and pulling that one out. Um, I'm a big believer that in our business, you should play for the promote. 
or the carried interest, meaning that we shouldn't be building wealth unless we're getting significant carried interest, significant promote that will uh, go to the team and, and to the management of the company. But you shouldn't be paying for that promote. You shouldn't be coming out of pocket to keep your lights on, to pay your employees, to have the right team, to live your own lifestyle. Uh, you should be making a fair wage and your team should be making a fair wage and your investors should want you to have the right economics so that you could have the right team. One of the things that struck me in raising our newest fund, Fund 5, this was the first fund that we really made the transition to true institutional investors. We have a lot of great high net worth family office investors, but now in Fund 5, we also have some pension funds, some some real institutions and endowment. And I was expecting as we got to larger and larger investors that to be you know, to to have to be sought for a significant fee reduction of, of our management fee. Uh, we have a fairly simple structure where we really just make a, a management fee on committed capital. And we do have a property management business that makes a market property management fee, but we really don't make any other fees. And uh, I was struck that in raising this fund that, yes, we gave a, a very small break to some of our largest investors, but a very small break. And I think the reason for that is these investors who understand that we're a relatively small platform, they don't want to dip too much into our pocket because they want to make sure that we're structured appropriately, that we have the right asset management team, the right acquisitions team, the right accounting team. They want to make sure that we're appropriately staffed, that we are not feeling uh, anxious about our, our economics. And one of the things that I think is really strong about the fund model and one of the things I, I really like about the fund model, it's not the reason we're in the fund model. The reason we're in the fund model is because it's easier to do deals and it's, it's, a, it's a much easier structure and it helps us win the best deals. But one of the things that is another benefit of the fund model is that in times like this, that we are very slow on acquisitions, we are not econom economically uh, nervous about the future. I, I know in 2024, that we have a fee stream to be able to feed our significant beast, to be able to feed the, the team that we have that is still asset managing a significant portfolio and certainly looking to invest fund five. Uh, and I'm not worried about doing deals in order to make sure that we keep the lights on. How have you thought about scaling and minimizing expenses as you've been incrementally raising larger and larger and larger funds? Because there's a certain point where you have to make some forward investment, maybe make a little less because your fund is a hundred million. And if you're getting a 2% fee, you're getting $2 million in revenue. That's it. You got to make it work versus 400 million. For sure. Uh, when we, when I spun off from the family business in 2012, we brought in a GP partner uh, who is uh, still a very close friend of mine today. Uh, and and they were very helpful in us starting the business, uh, helped us structure ourselves, helped us raise capital, but also provided liquidity that gave us working capital in order to, 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 to have this business. At that time, we had a very small friends and family fund one, and we were just embarking upon raising a, a fund two, which ultimately was only $56 million, so still a relatively small fund two. It wasn't until we raised our third fund, which was $110 million, until we started breaking even on, on, on fee income. So this is a very management-intensive business and uh, and requires, if you're going to do it right, having you have to structure yourself appropriately and recognize that there's going to be, even though I said a second ago, you don't want to pay for the promote, you have to capitalize yourself when you're starting one of these businesses appropriately so that you can afford to... to uh, to, to get to that break-even point. And it does require a significant amount of AUM in order to get there. What's been the biggest difference between high net worth and family office investors versus institutions in the capital raising side, but then also ongoing investor relations? So I'm going to focus more on the fundraising side. Um, at first, I'll get to the, to the ongoing uh, operations. But I think in that area, we've been very lucky and we have the right investors. But um, from a fundraising perspective, the biggest difference is the, um, you know, two things, a, the amount of time it takes to get to a yes, you can meet with an investor and uh, a high net worth family office investor and get a commitment immediately, you know, over that breakfast or coffee or lunch. Uh, and with an institution, it could take months and months and months. I mean, our, we, we, we have some very significant institutions in fund five and, I think the timeline from the initial meeting to getting the signed paperwork in was 
somewhere in the six to nine month range uh, on each of them. So it's a very significant process. Uh, it requires multiple meetings. It requires a significant due diligence process. There's a lot of process and procedures that one has to do in order to qualify for institutional investors. Uh, we never had a, you know, a significant DDQ until, you know, a, which is a due diligence questionnaire. We have policy and procedure manuals. We have a ESG policy, uh, all of which are very important in the institutional world. Um, and then you have all, even though you have your own DDQ, the you know the uh, institutional investor will still want you to fill out their version of a DDQ uh, in order to get to that institution, and it's a very drawn out process. But the other big difference is the, for lack of a better word, hit rate. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, we, we we tend to have a very high percentage of high net worth investors, especially at this point now that we've developed a a platform, and most of the new high net worth family office investors we meet tend to be referrals from existing investors. A very high percentage of those referrals end up investing. I mean, the institutional world. You, if if you're if you're if you from the first meeting to an actual investment, if you were at two or three percent, I think you'd be doing fantastic. Um, and it could easily be zero. <laughs> wow. And uh, yeah, raising institutional capital is very difficult. Um, I think, especially now that we've successfully done it, it is it is worth it. But I wouldn't. Uh, the one one thing that I would never have done is do it in lieu of the existing investor base. We have a great high net worth family office investor base. It's enabled us to get to this point. Uh, they're incredibly loyal, and we will be very loyal to them as well. Uh, and uh, I think in some ways it's one of the most valuable assets that the company has is the great Rolodex of investors that uh, are willing, you know, believe in us and have the confidence to invest in us. And we will continue to make sure that we're structured appropriately, that we can both have the high net worth investor, but also bring in the institution. Uh, and I think it's we're a, we're a enviable position to be able to have both. And the reason why is because while the high net worth investor is great and very loyal, it's also obviously harder to aggregate. And as we have multiple fund vintages, we had people commit to our fifth fund that are high net worth investors that were still fully invested at the time in fund three and fund four. So there are people that are invested in three vintages. So there's just a reality of, of, of allocation and, and, and high net worth investors should be, you know, you talked about employees a minute ago. And one of the things I didn't say that I was thinking is that I wouldn't want my employees, you know, when, when it comes to borrowing from me, I wouldn't want them to be too over allocated to 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 our business, just like for myself and for our investors, I want I I I, I preach diversity. I, I I think it's important that people live it. Uh, I've had people who have you know just in the conversation, high net worth investors in conversation with me, sort of almost accidentally tell me what percentage of their high, of their of their net worth they're investing with me, and I've told them, whoa, slow down. You should that's 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 too much. So when you have multiple vintages, uh, sometimes you just get to a point where there's just a limit of of how much you can raise from a high net a specific high net worth investor. We've been fortunate with with referrals and growth that we continue to be able to raise you know from new investors as well. But those institutions enable us to to to, to definitely geometrically grow the, the the business. And while I never aspire to be too big, I think one of our real strengths is that we're a sharpshooter that is a very specific strategy. And one of the strengths of that strategy is a focusing on an asset size that is a mid-market deal size. So I wouldn't want to be, um, I might regret saying this, I wouldn't want to be a multi-billion dollar fund. Um, while we it, size is very important to us, getting to the the our, our fund five is $320 million. Getting to $320 million would be very hard with just high net worth and family office investors. What's the best way to actually go out and raise the capital? And let's maybe just think about high net worth and family office investors. What have you found is the best way to continuously meet these people, whether they're in the fund or not in the fund, and ask them for money? Well, it's gotten a lot easier. Uh, it's, it's gotten easier because, A, we've developed a very strong track record, and we have a big investor base that I mentioned a second ago, refers. We also do a, you know, we, we do really strong reporting and our reporting is something that, uh, I think the high net worth investors sometimes share with their friends. They forward it. You know, uh, we also do a series of events. We do an event, a large event, uh, for an investor day in South Florida, but we do a satellite event in Houston. We've done satellite events in Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, even in Aspen, uh, over the summer. And those events not only are something that our investors go to, but they're able, they're something that they can invite their friends to come to. So we've really fostered an environment that sort of is very welcoming of referrals. Um, 
when we were starting, it was a lot harder. It was literally, you know, calling on the Rolodex, um, you know, meeting, you know, not not walking out of uh, the diner and, and and meeting somebody <laughs> like we had at lunch today, but uh, but definitely a lot of hustling, a lot more hustling than I had that I uh, that, that I uh, than, than I do today. It was harder to raise the fifty six million dollar fund two than it was to raise the three hundred twenty million dollar fund five. Um, but I think it's the number one thing is putting yourself out there. I mean, I, I think the asking people to have confidence in you to invest is not an easy thing to do. I think there's a lot of people that just don't have that confidence to, you know, to sit in front of that investor over a coffee or a breakfast or a lunch and, and, and ask for, for that investment. And what I have found is high net worth investors by and large invest in the jockey, not the horse. They're investing in you. I could tell them all day long why I think multi-tenant light industrial is the best asset class to invest in right now. And you're going to be able to tell them why hospitality investing is the best investment to invest right now. And by the way, I think we're probably both right, you know, for our own strategies. There's no, there's a lot of good strategies out there. And, uh, but it's, and and this is true absolutely for investors, bet on the jockey. If you have a, you know, I, while, while office might be the most contrarian investment out there right now. And and I personally wouldn't have the stomach for it. I am sure there are going to be really good office managers that are going to be very successful navigating these waters and be able to take advantage of a very distressed environment and be very successful right now, as there have been retail investors over the last few years that have been very successful. I think the most important thing is betting on that jockey who, number one, has the integrity because you can't. You know, there's the, 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 if if they don't have the integrity and they're going to cheat or steal from you, that you're or, or even you know, not communicate well with you, that's the, a non-starter. But if, 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 if you find somebody that is integrity, the transparency, and is going to be working hard and, and, and executing and staying disciplined on their strategy, then I think it's the, the, the then that, that works. Uh, I think very few investors, you know, maybe if you're that big pension fund, you can have a worldview that is why you want to allocate or why you have a asset allocation that requires a, you know, an investment to industrial and you're maybe over allocated hospitality. These high net worth investors, certainly they should have a degree of diversification. I'm not saying they shouldn't, but they should be investing and thinking about their jockey and not necessarily overly thinking about the deal. What are the characteristics that make for a successful reporting memo? It's something that we really, really focus on. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of is our reporting. Uh, and it's something that we have valued since inception. I mean, even going back to the family business, when we had our fund one, $17 million friends and family vehicle, uh, we always valued reporting. We, we, we even come to it from you know before that time when the family business, when we were with uh, big private equity firms. So we sort of learned that discipline. I'm a big believer that uh, a it's important to be transparent. It, every report that we send religiously uh, quarterly. I'm also a big believer that it, reports should be sent on a specific schedule, and whether you send that schedule quarterly, monthly, or annually, uh, stick to that schedule. I don't think I think it's very unhealthy to be an event reporter. So you know, if you're an event reporter, you might get into this trap of saying, "Well, if I'm just waiting for that permit to come in, and once that permit comes in, I'm going to send the notice to all the investors that the permit comes in." But what happens when the permit doesn't come in? If you say you're going to report on 45 days after every quarter, and on November 15th that report needs to go out. You know, you're going to have to send the report irrespective of whether the permit came in. So we we report 45 days after every calendar quarter. It goes out religiously, typically depending on days of the week and weekends, two to three days before that day. Um, but we've been we've been working on a very strong report that we've iterated over the years. But generally, the bones of it are pretty similar to the reports that we even sent to you know back to Fund One, and it always starts with a with a cover letter that I write. Uh, and uh, now a lot of the pieces of the cover letter go in all the different reports. So there's a market condition section that I write that talks about my per- perspective on the economy and the market and how that impacts our strategy and our business. Now, that doesn't change from fund five to fund four. Um, so, you know, that section is generally repeated from 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 report to report. But we really focus on reporting. And then the last thing it does is by being that on that calendar schedule, it provides a tempo for the entire business. So right now, I mentioned November 15th, that's when our reports went out. We're sitting here, you know, a week later, effectively, uh, although I don't know when you're going to actually release this, so <laughs> I, maybe I should have said that. But uh, whenever whenever you send this, it's a few weeks later, and uh, the, the, 
the the nature of of our business is that we're sort of like max knowledgeable on our properties, but you can't stay at that sort of peak knowledgeable for the entire three month period. So what ends up happening is we sort of you know we 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 all as a as a collective you know there's different every department has a different piece that they contribute. The asset management team contributes. The property management team contributes. Certainly the operations and accounting team contributes. Even the acquisition team contributes uh, you know, w- w- with their portion. Um, so everyone's contributed to this report and then it ramps down. And then in about 45 days when we start, you know, we literally, the the my COO will send out a, a calendar of deliverables and we will ramp back up again in 45 days for you know the Q4 report, which will be sent in, in advance of February 15th. How often do you meet with your senior team and what does that cadence look like? I just got a little bit of an insight of kind of like the process, but how do you manage the business on a weekly basis and what are those meetings that you're having? Yeah, so I have a, a Monday morning meeting with, uh, with, with my five direct reports, uh, which we call our director's meeting. Um, that those five departments are acquisitions, operations, accounting, uh, pro- asset management, property management, and investor relations. Uh, so the six of us meet every Monday morning and we have a really refined agenda that we've put together, almost similar to a YPO forum agenda, uh, that we've worked on for years. And, uh, everyone does advance work and, you know, so we actually keep it in one note. So, you know, by Sunday at eight o'clock, everybody's supposed to have filled out sort of their update. And the, the the format isn't what we don't want is an update meeting. We don't want people to get there and say the 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 the, the words that I detest in any meeting is as you all know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if someone's gonna say, as you all know, then please don't take the time in the meeting saying it. Um, but it but by completing the the their part of the agenda in one note in advance of the, of the meeting, we're all able to go in there and sort of review. And I'm able, you know, I'm able to see the asset management team is is signed this lease or close to sign this lease, or we might have an account receivable issue with this tenant, or on the acquisitions team uh, might be close to signing is, is making you know a second round offer or or we're getting to a a buyer interview on a on a deal, or we're maybe selling something and what the the timeline of that sale is and the due diligence period expires on this day. And, and, uh, so we're able to go in and then instead of people reporting, we're now able to ask pointed questions. Wait, I saw that that due diligence period ends on approximately this day, but it sounds like it could be extended. Is that, why don't you give more detail on that? So we, we were able to ask pointed questions. And then by doing that process, we're able to sort of take out presentations. And again, very similar to, you know, an organization that I know you and I are both very fond of YPO. Um, we, 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 we have, you know, people present on, on topics and hopefully on topics that they're able to use the, the, their fellow management team members to help them solve problems, not just, you know, give information. So is this an open conversation or once everyone provides their update on OneNote, is it a pretty clear agenda of go through specific issues that are identified through that preparation process or how does it come about where there are these presentations or someone wants to oh, we point try to, it to we, me we, out? We talk about it. We sort of try to flush out presentations uh, and we we keep a parking lot of future presentations. So we, you know, for next Monday's meeting, I already know there's two presentations that are taking place, but there might be an impromptu one as well. If something comes out of the meeting that is urgent or, or something happens over the next few days that, so we, 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 we left the last meeting identifying two presentations that will take place at the next meeting, but we also, you know, will often realize that there's something that we can, it, it, it might not be a presentation by an individual. It just might be a discussion, uh, that we're having on a, on a specific item. I, a friend of mine in your space doesn't have any acquisitions people. He has kind of brokery type people out there and investment people that work for his company. They're almost like asset managers. How have you thought about separating acquisitions folks from asset managers? Are they the same people? Are they different people? Do you need acquisitions people? I think we do need acquisitions people, but I also think we want them involved throughout the process. What I don't like is the model of you have a team that just buys the properties and they're like, okay, that was great. I succeeded. Here it is. Make it happen. Um, so we keep our acquisitions team involved on a 
it's 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 a it's a from the entire sort of spectrum of of the investment. And the way that we do that is they're involved, obviously, on buying it and financing it. They're also involved uh, on an annual valuation process. So we do we 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 do a valuation of every property every year, and they're involved with that process. And they we we come up with a sort of a new model. Uh, for every property every year, and that's one of the ways we we are able to compare how we're doing to what we said in our acquisition. But it also provides very good framework for setting up. So so we, we typically are working on new models in, in in over the summer in June July. That flows very well into the budgeting process that takes place between sort of late August through now. We're finishing our budgets for 2024 now. So those new models are informing the the budgets and. As we, you know, we, we we compare our when when a new lease comes in, we're able to compare the negotiated lease to both the 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 budget, but also the revaluation model that took place, and also the original acquisition model. Um, so the acquisition team is involved annually through that process, and also my CIO, who's one of the my partners who I mentioned, who's been with us since the beginning. Um, he's very involved with you know on an investment committee level with me and and our COO uh, of making ultimate leasing decisions on the biggest leases, and then obviously they're involved in dispositions as well. So we're you know I think there's real benefit to being boutique. And, you know, our asset management team and our acquisitions team sit on the same, you know, they sit, you know, within feet of each other in the same office. We're constantly able to, you know, go back and forth and ask questions. One of the things that's, you know, been interesting over, you know, coming out of the pandemic is we've we've moved a little bit to a hybrid work. But one of the things that was really important to me is that we had at least two days that everybody was in the office. So all everybody in our team is in three days a week, uh, Fridays. The office is available, but very few people come in. Mondays and Thursdays, everybody is in, and then Tuesdays and Wednesdays, it, it, it goes by departments. But uh, but at least we know Mondays and Thursdays, everybody are there together, and those are the days that there's a lot more collaboration. And you know, we're as as business owners and leaders, we're having this interesting tension right now between we know we're more productive when we're together. And it's it's very difficult to train people, very difficult to have corporate culture uh, remotely. On the other hand, we also, you know, are dealing with an employee base that also is yearning for a little bit more flexibility. And I think we found a little bit of a of a compromise there, but it's uh, it's not easy. Do you feel like it actually works for you as the owner, or you're going to continue to evolve? It it does work for me as the owner. And by the way, we're you know again, I don't know when you're going to release this, but we're filming this on a Tuesday, whatever that Tuesday is. And it so I know something like this where I'm going to be out of the office. I purposely schedule now on Tuesdays because there's less people in the office that I interact with on a daily basis. And I would also do that on a Friday. So I make I tend to make my meetings or even travel on Tuesdays and Fridays because I know that's not when the office when everyone's together. I would try very hard not to do that on a Monday or a Thursday when I know everyone is together. Um, we had a lot of conversations between three and four days, meaning everybody's in the office three days a week. Uh, and Tuesdays and Wednesdays are sort of the flex days that people come in based on departments. Um, we had a lot of conversations on whether or not three or four was the right amount. And my senior team, my directors that are my five direct reports felt very comfortable, very strong that that we could manage in, in, at three. I wasn't worried about them. I was worried about their people. So if they felt good about three, I felt good about three. How do you measure whether it's working or not? I measure based on our production as a company. I mean, so, you know, we're we're still, as I, you know, we're getting reports out. We're buying properties. We're not to the extent we're slow buying properties today. It has nothing to do with uh, <laughs> that's more of a market driven function. Uh, but when we are buying properties, we're accomplishing our due diligence. We're we're underwriting, you know, at the same tempo that we've always done. Uh, but it does, uh, you know, I listen to my reports, and they're, again, they're, I'm not worried about my five senior partners and whether or not they're getting done what they need to be done. The question is, are they able to leverage the more junior team? to make sure that they're getting done what, what's getting done. And they're telling me they are. So it seems to be working. I want to go back to your investment strategy a little bit. When you're in like an investment committee meeting or an acquisition meeting, what are the things that you tend to zero in on on a potential deal? Like your three or so KPIs that it's either going to be a go, no go, and you can kind of do a, the calculation in your head. Yeah. So it all comes back to this notion of sustainable cash flow. You know, 
Uh, yes, we care about IRR, but we want to really have confidence that the cash flow that we have is going to be maintained and grown over years. So what we look at is, you know, one of the things that's challenging in business, everybody loves talking about cap rates, but as we know, cap rates can be BS. And uh, one of the things that is really misleading from a, in, a, in, in industrial and some other r- related sectors like office is cap rates could be very misleading because cap rates don't include a lot of below the line items like (laughs) tenant improvement allowances, leasing commissions, um, capital expenditures. So you could have, you know, somebody could have their pump their chest out. They're buying something at a 10 cap. But if you really look at their underwriting and what they're going to need to spend in leasing commissions, tenant improvement allowances, uh, capital expenditures, maybe they need to, you know, totally retrofit the entire property, uh, that that 10 cap looks like a, you know, five and a half cap very quickly. Um, so we, we focus very closely on what the actual unlevered cash flow is. And then obviously as we lever it up, what the levered cash flow is, but we look very closely at, you know, we, I could care less about what a headline cap rate is. We sort of have come up with a definition of what we consider to be an adjusted or a net cap rate, which takes it, you know, which looks at the totality of the investment and what our unlevered average cash on cash is. And if we can buy something in the six range and still lever it up, you know, with a little bit of a positive spread and get to the a, you know, six to seven percent, maybe eight percent uh distributable cash flow, uh, then I think we're in a very good place. Um so that's a very that 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 to us is the most important thing. The other thing I look at is 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 our our we have a we we focus in on our expiration schedule and not just how what percentage of tenants are expiring on an annual basis, but what their rents are going to be upon that expiration. So you know it's very easy, and I mentioned earlier that paper can accept anything. People love, especially in industrial today, to talk about rent growth. When you talk about that tenant that's used to paying ten dollars a foot, and all of a sudden you're telling them that the new market rent is fifteen dollars a foot, that's going to be very, very difficult to pass through to that tenant. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we care very much about renewal ratio. So when we're underwriting, we're probably not going to, even though the market might be at fifteen dollars a foot, we'll probably try to, you know, ease that tenant into that number. So maybe we'll put for that that space where that tenant was at a very low rate. Maybe we'll put in a twelve fifty or thirteen rate, and think that you know, twenty twenty or twenty five percent, thirty percent increase on them is already quite significant. To think that you're going to get a fifty percent rental rate increase on a tenant is very, very challenging. So we're looking very closely at not just what the market rents are, but what the percentage increase on a specific tenant is, because we want to make sure that we feel very good that we can maintain that tenant and have a decent chance at that renewal, and that. You know, that's underwriting. But then we most importantly, we actually go out and speak to the tenants. You know, I'm a big believer in tenant interviews um, and we don't buy a property and we don't put a deposit at risk or go hard on a deal until we've met all the tenants in a property. And now we're not going to be able to ask them and, the, you know, the seller probably has a representative there, the brokers there. We're very we're not asking them, are you going to renew? <laughs> but we ask a lot of questions that sort of gets to the heart of their business. And we try to glean some information on how happy they are in the space and what the likelihood is of a eventual renewal. What are some of the questions that you ask? Well, how are you utilizing the space? Are you, is the space the right size for you? Do you need more space? Do you need less space? You know, are, are, is, is the ratio of warehouse and depending on what they have, they might have labs, they might have assembly or manufacturing. Inevitably, almost everybody has a percentage of office. Is it the, is, is, is the space working for you in terms of that ratio today? Uh, we talk about uh, the neighboring tenants and are there disruptive tenants or, you know, the parking, we talk about security, we talk about physical issues. You know, we, we, when we all do due diligence, every, every property condition assessment comes back and can say there's, you know, there's a potentially a roof leak. The tenant will tell you this is the spot the roof leaks. Um, so, or, or this is the spot that, you know, has a window issue. So we learn more in tenant interviews than we do on anything else in our due diligence process. I want to talk a little bit about the approach to acquisitions and your strategy around investment size. Because a lot of people guide their investment size based upon how much capital they can raise or how much debt they can get. Now that you have a fund, you have capital, but you are focusing in on a very specific size 
in terms of your strategy. Why is that important? It's important because it's where we find the right deals and where we believe as a, we would consider ourselves to be a mid-market investor, focusing on equity checks between 10 and $30 million, which tends to be, you know, roughly a 30 to $75 million deal tends to be bigger than what the high net worth group that's passing the hat around is going to be able to, to do. Now we'll on occasion drop down and do smaller, but also smaller than that larger institution. We want to be sort of the big fish in the small pond. So when we, almost all of our deals ultimately go to a buyer interview and we're, we, we had one just the other day, uh, actually yesterday, we had one yesterday, uh, where we're on a Zoom and we're, we're 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 with the brokers and we're meeting with the sellers and they're we're looking them in the eye and telling them that we're not just you know the right buyer because we put the right price on the letter of intent but we're also going to close on that 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 price and in our business as you know there's a pretty lengthy period of time from that time that you sign that letter of intent to the time that you put that deposit at risk and yeah we're spending a little bit of money but the amount of money that we're spending in due diligence isn't going to be the amount of money that's going to you know for that 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 people won't um, adjust price or retrade the deal if they they feel that they need to. We do a fair, we do a, a lot of homework up front. We're really experts on this one space. All we do is this multi-tenant light industrial product. So we're 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 sort of a one-trick pony. We know the right questions they ask, know what's under the hood. And we're able to get to that buyer interview, look that seller in the eye and tell them, unless you're something is unless something comes out in due diligence that we're not expecting or you're hiding something from us or the market fundamentally changes, uh, we're going to be able to close at that, 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 that price in our letter of intent. And we are, we are, we are, we are known as closers, uh, not retraders. Uh, so, you know, that is incredibly important to us. How are you sourcing deals? I think the, what I just talked about is the number one, we source deals is we have a great reputation as being the right buyer. And this is a, 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 a niche. You, you asked a second ago, I, I didn't get back to the ultimate question, which is on deal size. So on deal size, we are in a, we, 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 when, we're, when we're competing uh, at that buyer interview level, and we are the usually the only group with the fund with discretionary capital that is, that is there at that buyer interview, that seller is there might be somebody, and it often is the case, that there's somebody with a higher price and they're coming back to us. Usually the deals that we get, they're coming back to us and say, hey, listen, you're not the top bidder, but if you could get to here, if you could bridge the gap a little, we'll award you the deal or just award us the deal because they have confidence in our ability to close. There's a big difference in having discretionary capital and not have to worry about passing the hat around or finding that private equity firm investor to in order to go forward. Uh, so having discretionary capital is a huge differentiator as, as a buyer. Uh, so how we, 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 we source deals, we source deals by being a real leader and expert in a very specific niche asset class that we're known as closers. The brokers know us, the sellers know us. We've done a fair amount of repeat business with the same sellers because they thought the experience went well and we lived up to everything we said we would do. And that to us is the best situation. We actually had the buyer interview we had yesterday. We were able to talk to the, the, the team that was uh, on the buyer interview was a larger company, didn't even realize that we had previously bought from the same firm, but we certainly pointed out to them and we, you know, mentioned to them <laughs> their colleagues that they should go talk to. Um, so we, 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 we on occasion do an off market deal. But in our space where things are mostly brokered, I'm a I'm very dubious that off-market deals are truly off-market. And very rarely are they at a significant discount. Um, I know for me as a seller, would I sell something off-market? Sure. But only with very high degree of confidence that we're at a number higher than we would get to in the marketing process. Because I'm taking a fair amount of risk that, you know, by by not doing a process, so I have to be really confident that the number is 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 a strong number, not a weak number. So the the broker community is very influential, and we need to have a great reputation, a great relationship with brokers and sellers, and be known as the right buyers. And uh, and we believe that we've achieved that. Uh, and and uh, living up to what you say you're going to do is very important. Given that you have a fund now. Are you trying to close all cash and maybe refinance in a year? How are you thinking about debt in an environment where maybe rates have capped out, but they're potentially going to decline if you believe in the yield curve? 
I'm a believer of, you know, we're in the real estate operating business and the real estate investment business. We're not in the interest rate prediction business. So if a deal for a deal to work, it needs to work where the rate environment is today. So I'm not tying up deals and closing on deals and hoping that interest rates improve and gambling on the debt market in order to be successful. Uh, We are pricing deals based on where the interest rate environment is at the time of acquisition. We're putting mid to long term debt on it that is timed uh, that that's termed out for the length of the investment that we're 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 we're, we're estimate holding, and we're going to have confidence that uh, we're going to accomplish the investment based on our ability to buy right and our ability to operate right, and it's not going to be predicated on the interest rate environment moving in our direction. Um, now. Is it possible that we could close for cash in the right situation that it might have enable us to get a deal done quicker or, you know, it is possible, but it's also very inefficient with a fund model. Because keep in mind, while we have a fund, we're not sitting on all that capital. It's a called capital model. So we do capital calls. It wouldn't be, you know, the necessarily the 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 best efficiency to call capital and then return it or to sit on it. Um, so it's it, most deals, 90 <laughs> to 100 percent of deals are going to have the right debt put on them at the time of acquisition. I ask all the guests on the podcast the same closing question, and that's, what's your favorite hotel? My favorite hotel? Okay. Um, That's a good question. Uh, I think hotels are about experiences. So I'm sure I've been to some fantastic hotels, but when you ask the question, I think about, you know, why was that hotels? And I, I think, you know, especially back to my honeymoon, which at this point was over 16 years ago, but um, we went to some fantastic hotels on our honeymoon, but the most memorable was uh, in Northern Thailand at the Golden Triangle, we went to the Four Season Tented Camp and literally staying in these luxury tents, but with elephants. And we were, I think they called us Mahoots, which is like an elephant <laughs> trainer or elephant rider. And we literally rode elephants for a couple of days while living in these tents that were unbelievably lu- luxurious in, in the jungles of Northern Thailand. So that definitely was the most memorable one. I love it. I've never been there. I've heard about it. It's on the list. It's one of the best answers we've got. It's fantastic. I highly recommend it. I even have, I think, still a video of uh, of me somehow telling the elephant to spray, you know, this muddy, crappy water <laughs> on my wife, my new wife at the time. She's still with me. So, you know, you could, you know, you have the right one when you could spray uh, muddy, crappy water on them. And uh, she's still there the on the honeymoon. On the honeymoon. I like it. Yeah. Thanks for coming on the podcast. This it was great. a lot of fun. Thanks, Hey everyone, it's Jake here. Thanks again for joining me on this conversation. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Lastly, don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Jay Warzak. I'll see you in the next episode. Jake Warzak is the founder and CEO of Dove Hill Capital Management. All opinions expressed by Jake and his guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Dove Hill Capital Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and does not reflect or represent real estate, financial, or investment advice. Mm-hmm.